Welcome to Friends in Fiction, five best-selling authors and the stories. Novelists Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, Patty Callahan Henry, and Mary Alice Monroe are five longtime friends with more than 80 published books to their credit. In 2020, they created Friends in Fiction to provide author interviews and fascinating insider talk about publishing and writing, and to highlight independent bookstores. These friends discuss the books they've written, the books they're reading now, and the art of storytelling. If you love books and you're curious about the writing world, you're in the right place. Hi, everybody. Hi. I'm Mary Kay Andrews. This is Friends in Fiction. We are so happy that you are here. I'm Kristen Harmel. I'm Christy Woodson Harvey. I'm Patty Callahan Henry. And I'm Mary Alice Monroe. And this is Friends in Fiction, five New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories, all to remind you to shop local when you can and keep supporting independently owned bookstores. Now we're going to go off script for a little bit because, you know, we love to celebrate and so we've got something special to celebrate tonight. Miss June, otherwise known as Kristen <laughs> Hermel, <laughs> charted on the New York Times bestseller list today. She's, charted, she's C -H -A -R -T -E -D. <laughs> she charted oh at number nine God. with oh God, uh, the Book of Lost Names. And so we're going to all uh, raise a toast. <laughs> To Kristen, Charted again. again. <laughs> if you haven't, <laughs> if you have oh not God. got your copy <laughs> of the paperback of the Book of Lost Names, uh, what are you waiting for? Go get it. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, so that I can chart again. <laughs> That's right. So you can keep charting. Keep charting every week. Yes. Thank you. Well, we're the worst. Okay. <laughs> okay. Also, some other good news. Oh, my God. Our friend Ellen hit number one. Yes. On Ellen Hildebrand. Yes. Ellen Hildebrand. Yes. Oh, hooray yes. for Ellen. I'm thrilled for her. Yes. We're very excited. So excited. Well, tonight, we are also very excited because we get to have a very good friend of all of ours, best-selling author, Susan Wiggs, whose latest book, The Lost and Found Bookshop, came out to rave reviews last summer and the paperback just released this week. There's nothing we love better than indie bookstores, so you know we love this book set in a quaint San Francisco bookshop. One of the questions that were central to the novel was, if you had to do it all over again, what would you do and who would you be? Mm -hmm. You can be sure we're going to ask Susan that very question. But first, we want to thank our incredible partner, Mama Geraldine's, whose cheese straws and cookies we all love. With summertime here, it's so easy to pick up a package of Mama G's bodacious cheese straws or cookies, including the gluten-free ones, to pop into your beach bag or, if you're like me, into your tennis bag so you can grab a snack between sets. Remember, as always, you can get 20% off your order at MamaGeraldine's.com with the code FAB5. And I think, Patty, you had a cool announcement to make, huh? So this community has been growing like wildfire mm -hmm. and we have had the most amazing year, but this week, y'all, because of you out there, we have just passed the 40,000 member mark mm -hmm. and we want to celebrate with amazing. you because so happy. this has been the most incredible community and Cheers. we feel like you're part we're friends with you, you're friends with us. And mm -hmm. this is this is a community built out of a pandemic that turned into something much bigger and much better. So thank Best you. Best thing that happened to the after the pandemic. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, yeah, for how, sure. how lucky are we? We're so grateful to all mm -hmm. of you out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what's great to toast good news with? 
good wine, <laughs> good wine that is a match made in heaven for book lovers. So last week, we officially kicked off the summer of story points on Friends mm -hmm. and Fiction with a surprise drop in from our friend Ellen Hildebrand, who is celebrating the publication of her new book, which is now a number one New York Times bestseller that certainly mm -hmm. deserves a sip. Not of wine, a coincidence right? at all. I don't think. You know, I, Not I, a coincidence. Not I, I'm mm -hmm. just saying. But mm -hmm. each week, the after show will be called Sip and Stay with Story Point and will be sponsored by story point wines you never know who will drop in there might even be someone coming tonight so make sure make sure you stick around for the fun and the sips and in a bit we'll also be telling you about our featured bookseller of the week liberty bay books which is a special place to our guest susan wiggs liberty bay books located in the beautiful town of poolsbow washington started out as shotwell's bookstore which sounds a little bit like charted Shotwell's bookstore <laughs> in 1977 and was purchased by Suzanne Droppert in 1996. And then in February 2020, local children's author Susan Selfors purchased the store, continuing the line. Um, we cannot wait to tell you about another book that's coming to bookstores on July 6th, and that is again our own Miss June, otherwise known as Kristen <laughs> Harmel. She will have the Forest of Vanishing Stars out, and um, we're going to let her tell you all about it. I cannot believe, thank you, Kathy, I cannot believe we are less than four weeks from the launch. Gosh. So tonight, tonight, I am really excited to share the trailer with you, Sean. I can't wait to see the honor. <laughs> It was Yay! thrilling. Oh, it was absolutely <laughs> thrilling. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. So set in the Show forest bomb. of Easter. I know it, they did such a good job, right? Yeah, I, all the credit beautiful. goes to gallery books. That was amazing. <laughs> so set in the forest of Eastern Europe during World War II, the forest of vanishing stars is the story of a woman who was kidnapped from her German parents and mm. raised alone deep in the woods with almost no human contact. But when her kidnapper dies in 1942 and her life collides with that of a family of fleeing Jewish refugees, everything changes. It's based on the real life stories of Jewish refugees who fled into the forests and survived the war that way truly astonishing real life tales of survival. And tonight, if you pre-order it from Liberty Bay Books, not only will you have my deep and endless gratitude, because every <laughs> pre-order really helps a book's trajectory, but you will also have one of these wish bracelets. Sean, do you have a picture of it? Um, if not, I've got one right here. They, um, yes. There so you go. They are made especially for friends in fiction, um, and they have the little nice. star for the Forest of Vanishing Stars and the um, friends in fiction blue string. I've got one on right now. Uh, and I so love order, it. Yeah, thank you. It's it's one of those ones that like, you know, it's supposed to, you wear it until it falls off and then you get a wish, which I think is kind of nice. Um, so yeah, this is it. And uh, if you, pre you pre-order the book by Saturday from Liberty Bay, I will send it to you myself along with the signed book plate. So I hope you'll consider it. Thank you. Love it, love it, love <laughs> awesome. it. Love it. I love mine. Okay, so now for our parade essay this week, Mary Kay wrote about a subject near and dear to all of our hearts and her heart, beach books. Yeah, well, you know, I thought the timing was pretty good. And my books, you know, are sold and thought of as beach books. And I'm proud of that, by the way. I wanted to share my thoughts about what makes a beach books and why I want to banish that phrase, guilty pleasure when it comes to books. It. And I also want to give folks some suggestions about where and how to choose your summer reads. Mm -hmm. So, ladies, what's your idea of a perfect beach book? You know, first of all, I loved the essay. I thought it was so great. Oh, it's um, so good. And you touched on so many really interesting points. Um, I, When I think of beach reads, I really think of something that, like, just has a happy ending. And I know that's kind of yeah. – sometimes you don't know if it has a happy ending till the book is over. So that's mm -hmm. kind of hard. But – um, I don't think I have a specific genre and I actually, this is kind of weird, but I like save up my thrillers all year long. Cause I always read oh. before I go to bed and I don't like to read thrillers before bed. Cause I get like so keyed up and then I can't sleep. So I save them for the summer and I read them on the beach. That's awesome. I love Great idea. that. Yeah. I love that. For me, it's anything 
anything that sweeps me away that I can't put down. And that is a kind of a ping or sensory mm -hmm. memory or reminder of the hours and days that slipped away when I was a child with a mm -hmm. pile of sand covered yeah, exactly. library books. That just feels like a summer read, no matter whether it's fiction, nonfiction, thriller. Yeah. That's yeah. it exactly. I couldn't agree with you more. And Mary Kay, I love what you said about, about abolishing that phrase, guilty pleasures. I mean, who says that? We should never feel guilty about any reading we do, no matter mm -hmm. what. If it's a rom-com or thriller or nonfiction or nature book, magazines, whatever, read on the beach or read on the porch on your your, the rocking chair on your front porch or that little chair you put by the kiddie pool while you're watching the kids read, <laughs> read, read, because summertime is the time we have time off. Summertime is vacation time. So read wherever you want. And that is not guilty. That's just pure pleasure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, I usually like something a little lighthearted in the summer for my beach reads, but summer's also the time I will binge read an author who is new to me yeah. like the summer I tore through every Eleanor Lipman novel I could find okay. one after the other like eating potato chips I read <laughs> um, my Love favorite that. of hers is the family man it's so good it's so funny it's so wry and touching and sweet and really about forgiveness and redemption so mm. yeah I, I yeah <laughs> For me, I think it's anything that keeps me absorbed in the story, but also lets me look up and take part in a conversation or take a dip in the water mm -hmm. or whatever, and then mm -hmm. return to exactly where I left mm -hmm. off without missing a beat. And it's mm -hmm. also that book that you're thinking about when you're not reading it. So you can engage yeah. in other things, but, you know, but then you're excited to get back to it, like, mm -hmm. like an escape, like, you know, a beautiful part of your vacation. Yeah. Um, so like last weekend, we were visiting my in-laws at the beach and I flew, absolutely flew through Lisa Barr's upcoming novel, Woman on Fire. Fire, which was just, it had I these, love her. Oh, oh my God, she's so great. But it was action packed and fast moving and had these absorbing characters. It was just everything I wanted in that book that kept me riveted completely. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, this is all fine and good, but I want to get to talk to <laughs> our guest, Susan yeah. Wiggs, my copy of the Lost and Found Bookshop. Here it is. It's <laughs> oh, look at that. I love it. Wow. I know. I don't usually write in books, but I did this time. It's bristling with my post-it notes <laughs> uh, of paragraphs and book mentions, including a very special mm. post-it marking the Easter egg I found on page 185. And I know lots of you read it when it first came out in hardback last summer, and we, we just couldn't get Susan on back then. But So we're glad to have her on now that it's out in paperback. So if you have questions for her, leave them in the comments. I kind of have the feeling there's going to be a pop quiz or something looking at all those like post-it notes. I'm, right. I'm having like, like nervous school flashbacks. I don't ever do that, but I did it with this book because it was about books, you know, oh, and that awesome. touched me. Yeah. Well, I'm so excited to talk to her about it, but let me tell you about Susan Wiggs. She's a number one in New York Times bestseller and the author of more than 50 novels, wow. including the Lakeshore Chronicles series and the instant New York Times bestsellers, Family Tree and the Oysterville Sewing Circle. Mm -hmm. Susan lives at the water's edge, which sounds like a book title. Mm -hmm. um, oh, the who Pugets, would think of that? Yeah, the water's edge, the water's <laughs> end. Anyway, <laughs> she lives at the water's edge on, the, on an island in the Pugets Sound. If you follow her on Instagram, you can catch the breathtaking photos she takes of the sunset and the water. Look at that. Beautiful. Golly. And in good weather, she commutes to her writer's group in a 21-foot boat. She's also a grandmother to a precious little girl named Clara. And my daughter and son-in-law moved to a little island on the Pouchet Sound two days ago. So when she gets here, maybe we'll set up a play date with Bridget <gasps> and Clara and take them it. to a bookshop. <laughs> I love that. Um, a graduate of Harvard, Susan Wiggs is a former teacher who describes herself as an avid hiker, an amateur photographer, a good skier, and a terrible golfer. I, I am also a terrible golfer, who says her favorite form of exercise is curling up with a good book. Yeah, she's our lady. <laughs> yeah. She probably has a lot of agreement right now with that one. <laughs> 
So let's bring Susan on. Yeah. Hey, Hi, Hi, Susan. Hi, Susan. Hello, Susan. Hi. 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 Thank you for having me. We finally got you on, you busy girl. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I love that your intro was so flattering. I was I you made me sound way more important than I am. <laughs> I doubt that. Never. Never. We are so glad to finally get you on, and we would love for you to tell everybody about. I don't know, the elevator pitch for the Lost and Found Bookshop. Oh, God. It's a book about books. It is that um, life, that alternate life that that you live when you fantasize about, you know, what would my what would my life look like if I was, you know, if I were to actually go for something like that. And so mm -hmm. I think every writer I know kind of dreams about being a bookseller. And so I created this fantasy bookstore, but it's really grounded in um, some things about my life. Um, oh, this is supposed to be elevator pitch and I'm like rambling on. Anyway, it's grounded with um, some real life challenges that I have in my life and, and um, in terms of caregiving of an elderly person. And, mm. but it's also filled with everything that I love about books and writing in bookstores. And so um, I think you mentioned in the in the intro there were some Easter eggs uh, all throughout that. Um, most of the books that I reference um, in the Lost and Found Bookshop are actual books that I've I've read and loved. There are a couple of made up ones, which you probably, as fellow authors, you probably recognize those as well. But anyway, thank you so much for having me. I I love the setup. I love your group. I love all of your books. Um, and the first time I, I was thinking about the first time that I met Mary Kay and um, we were on a panel or something and she was dressed so well. I, I, I couldn't Me? stop looking her up. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. She, she, was like, you no, she was dressed shocked. like her book cover. No, she was dressed like her book cover. I think it was the Weekenders and every single color that was on the, the cover, it was the hardcover. Um, you had wow. on your outfit, your jewelry and your top, and it was just so <laughs> yummy. And I thought, God, I want to be her. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Anyway, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I, had all and I loved your books. Yeah, I think that a lot. So. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, we are looking forward to asking you lots of questions, and we will. But to all of the viewers out there, remember to put your questions for Susan in the comments, and we'll be pulling a few to ask you later in the show. So of course I've got to ask, what prompted you to write a book about a bookstore? It was one of those uh, moments um, where I, I knew some things about the story, but I didn't have quite the challenge that I wanted for the main character. And at the same time, I was, um, I was trying to, I was trying to, I, I love people, who face the middle of their life, well, she's not the middle of her life, she's in her 30s, um, who realize they're on the wrong path and they're like, yeah. oops, I gotta make a change here. And mm -hmm. she doesn't realize it. She's one of those clueless ones who needs, you know, kind of a, a kick in the pants in order to put yeah. her on a different path. And so in the beginning of the book, she's sort of this buttoned down corporate um, um, person, very, discipline very and she has a kind of free-spirited mom who <laughs> we learn early on in the book um you know we don't get to really meet mom in person <laughs> but anyway natalie uh comes to realize that the thing that she wants to do is the thing that she's most afraid of but she tackles it anyway and that's becoming um the proprietress of an independent bookshop in old San Francisco in a historic old building that has a whole history of its own. So mm, that's amazing. So I have to tell you, Susan, that the ladies here have a nickname for me and it's peach because of PCH <laughs> and oh. you have a peach. So yeah. you have made me into a man okay. and a handyman. <laughs> <at that. laughs> A man with a ponytail and a tool belt. A ponytail yeah. and a tool belt. I'll just put Kathy in a tool belt. A hired yes. hammer. I love that. A hired hammer. <laughs> uh, a hired I hammer. Just, yeah. I just loved it. I was like, oh, wow, that's awesome. So when the book opens, your protagonist, Natalie Harper, is toiling away. As you mentioned, she's doing corporate things. 
But I love that she's at a wine distributorship mm -hmm. in Sonoma Valley. And she's very good at, of all things, inventory control, <laughs> which is a job she has come to hate, but she yeah. clings to it. Because, I mean, inventory control literally sounds like a, a job I'd quit in an hour. And so she clings Absolutely. to it because it offers the one thing she craves or thinks she craves, which is predictability, security, and a good paycheck, mm -hmm. benefits, you know, the, the little check yeah. boxes we have. Mm -hmm. I think so many people can relate to that. Yeah. And I'm really curious if you are ever in a situation like that. I never was because my in my former life I was a teacher and um, te actually teachers have stability and predictability. Um, they don't have a salary. <laughs> the yeah. most, among the most yeah. underpaid people, yeah, right. you know, that I can think For of. And so, do. right, right, exactly. And so the only thing that's like even more pauperish than a teacher is probably an aspiring writer. So I was both of those. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I I really, I wanted her in Archangel, which is a made up town from another book. So that was kind of a little Easter egg for, for readers of the other books. Yeah. But I, I wanted her to have, um, you know, ties to California, but in the wrong role. And I, I was like you, I was like, what's the most, um, you know, dreadful Thing that I can think of, and it's inventory control. I, I know, even, right? It gives me a panic. Soul crushing job. That's <laughs> soul crushing. So, did right. you? How did you get the courage to take the leap from teacher to writer? Because even though it didn't have the salary, it had the security. I mean, yeah. it did. Yeah, it, absolutely. And the healthcare, and my daughter was little. Mm -hmm. um, yep. It was. Um, I had a couple of books um, back in the in the nineties that that kind of moved me into um, being just, you know, a, a hopeful writer to an actual earning writer with probably, probably a future, you know, none of us ever have, it, you know, the yeah. ultimate stability of, of a whole corporate structure behind us. But, you yeah. know, there were some signs, you know, I um, hired a really awesome literary agent. We're still together. Meg Ruley. Are any of you next? Wait, we're agent sisters. I think oh, okay. Well, oh. see, Meg does oh. that. She's like a Mormon husband. Where she you always, when you're with her, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you think you're the only one. Oh my God. <laughs> that is such a great, that's a great way to put it. So she doesn't tell you nothing <laughs> about what goes on with the other one. Yeah, so, Patty, anyway, you're going to have to call up Meg and say, wait, you have other clients? What? Exactly. I'm going to check right now. I know. I know. She, yeah. she's, a, she's a a polygamist. She can't help it. She's <laughs> and she's also That's incredible. Cool. But so, in, we don't so, care. But, but we don't in, care. Yeah, but as you know, in, in, in the publishing world, when you know that you have um, a team, and you have the right associates around you who are going to help you, you know, accomplish your your goals and your dreams. Then yep. it's still a leap of faith because you still live from book to book and contract to contract. But I I felt like I I was able to do that. So I off that. I went, and so I, I I published my first book in 1987. Oh my goodness. I know. I know. I'm so old. That's still a lot. I mean, when you consider 50 books, yeah. oh my goodness. I was gonna, that's Hard exactly working. what I was going to say. Working. It's, it's still not <laughs> that long to have written 50 books. No, that's No, because I was published 80. Was it that? No, no, you were published before me, but I'm a piker compared to you. <laughs> that's funny. Well, I, I see I see Ron Block is saying in the comments hashtag author wives, which I love. There we go. <laughs> oh, 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 that's that's good. Good. Okay, I steal that title. I claim that title. I so, love yeah. it. so so like Susan, that. Susan, you said in our friends in fiction newsletter this week that when you were a kid, you fell in love with Shakespeare and Company, the English language bookstore in Paris, because you and your family lived nearby. I had no idea that you used to live in yeah, Paris. Yeah, I didn't either. 
I, I also lived in Paris in the seventh and I was on the same block as the American library in Paris, which you might know. Um, and one of my mm-hmm. good friends in Paris, when I was living there, worked at Café Le Petit Pont, which was on the same block as Shakespeare and Company. So um, I was there all the time too. So for me, living in Paris, though my time there was brief, it really shaped me as a writer. Um, and I think it was partially because there's such a wonderful literary tradition in that city. Mm-hmm. And the French culture just kind of inspires us to stop and smell the roses, to slow down and appreciate the details. Do you yeah. think, as was the case with me, do you think that your time in Paris, even though you were there when you were young, shaped you in some way into the way you write today or into the writer you've become? 100%. Yeah, 100%. Mm-hmm. That it, It's, you know, I always knew that I would write. I always knew from, you know, before I could even read, before I could barely talk, you know, I would scribble things and tell my mother, write this down. And I would babble out a story and, you know, God love her, she would write down the story. Wow. And um, so live, and I, she saved them. So I still have these little scribbles and stories that I told her when I was three years old. So I always knew, and, and there was an upstairs room in Shakespeare and Company where I would take my my, my journal, my teenage angsty journal, and, and I would just write away and I think that um, when you find a place that feels like that to you um, it it helps you develop your voice and your voice is always changing as a writer but there are some things that are just a through line you know that you started writing when you were in seventh grade and you know you're still thinking about these things yeah. and I think there was there's a book that everybody should read readers and writers called on writing by Stephen oh, King. Yeah. Oh my God. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a nice. page there. My favorite page in the book is where he talks about a writer always returns to the same, like three or four themes again and again and again yes. in yes. different ways throughout, you know, the, your storytelling mm-hmm. life. And I, I remember um, just being such a dreamer and being in that bookshop. So Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, if you, it should be on everybody's bucket list, definitely every reader's bucket list. And every time I go to Paris, I go there. Oh, the bins so there's certain things about it that never have changed. I've got I, keep waiting. <laughs> I keep waiting for, you know, I go through the bins and I keep looking and I just keep waiting one book. I just want to see one of my books in there. <laughs> <laughs> just uh, one. Yeah. Well, speaking of books, I want to go back to the Lost and Found bookshop. Can I just say I really love the cover? It's really beautiful. I always mm-hmm. did from the hardcover and now Didn't the Didn't they just that. nail that cover? Yeah, they oh, did. Yeah. And I, they it's did. Beautiful. It's just, yeah. Yeah, really great. And I'm glad you kept it for the paperback. You know, sometimes they change it. So anyway, in this wonderful book, um, Natalie, the heroine, her world just explodes when her mother and then her boyfriend are killed in this horrible plane crash. Mm -hmm. And this is, and Blythe is the owner of the Lost and Found Bookstore, which means now Natalie has to assume ownership. And this is a failing, financially debt-ridden business. And then later her beloved grandfather dies. And so the phrase that we all know, which is an, uh, a writing phrase called kill your darlings. And that's when we like to up the stakes. So I'm curious, you killed a lot of darlings in this book. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so I'm, did you, is this part of your plot or did you always know that Natalie needed an impetus to step out of her old life. And I think I know what you're going to say because you touched on it a little bit, but talk about killing your darlings in, the, in this book. I think that um, drama comes from people facing their worst fears and their mm-hmm. worst wow. situations that they can think of. And so, um, and I always had yeah. a really strong, powerful relationship with my mother and I have a strong relationship with my daughter. And so, um, I, those were our soft place to fall. But when that's taken away, then what do you do? And so mm-hmm. I, I wanted that Nat- everything stripped away from Natalie right in the beginning so that she almost had no choice. And mm-hmm. I set it up so that she couldn't, I mean, her first thought was, I got to dump this bookstore. You know, I've got my job. I'm an inventory control expert. You know, why would I ever, you know, take the risk of being a bookseller? But um, the the truth is, and most booksellers that I talked to as I was writing the book said, um, booksellers, uh, bookshops can be really vibrant and they can be profitable. They mostly always are if they're well run. 
and if they don't have like a flaky owner and you know are poorly managed but a, a well-managed independent bookstore makes it, it is a profit making business it is mm -hmm. and so i i wanted her to have to take you know have to sort out in the aftermath of this you know horrible way that her mother leaves her um my the, her darling mother she was a darling and sort of rebuild her life around around the bookstore and around her grandfather who's dealing with dementia and some other health issues and yeah. that come clear later in the book and so i felt like she was too insulated by supportive people. So I took all her as support. You took them all away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and that's kind of what we do when we move from being, um, you know, a teacher to a writer. I was, yeah. I've was i always been a yeah. single income family. And so um, I never had a patron of the arts. I never had a, you know. And so it, it it raises the stakes, I think, yeah, and for it sure. made it see you know kind of sure. amped up the drama in that book. And I just have to say, it also is an inspiration for people who are considering opening or keeping a, their independent bookstore alive in their community. You know, it works. Oh, I love the, everything the you more just the said. Exactly. Yeah. You know, speaking of Blythe, you know, at, when you start the book, I think, oh, another airhead mom, irresponsible. <laughs> And then I think you do such a beautiful job of um, unfolding her character. And, you know, I started thinking, why could I not have met Blythe Harper? Oh, <laughs> I would nice. especially oh. like to thumb through the books on her <laughs> Words of Wonder shelf at the bookstore. Now, when you read the book, you will see that um, Blythe, who... Uh, her, um, Natalie's mom, who owns the bookstore and has run it for many years, she has a shelf called her Words of Wonder, and it has books that she returns to um, for, you know, deep thoughts. So <laughs> I wondered if you would name some of those books on the Words of Wonder shelf and um, whether they were books that you have personally turned to over the years, because it was a kind of an eclectic mixture really mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah it was um it, it's a it's a shelf that i would definitely have if i had a bookstore um because i'm a well i, I read a lot of ebooks now and 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 so i can't do it but i'm such a um i mark up I, I don't mark them up but i put tabs in my books and you know i want to remember things that i read and particularly meaningful passages and so yeah you know there's we all have those books that are just kind of part of our blood and bone and mm. and so I fantasized about you know what what would be on the shelf and for me it would be everything from the carrot seed which is the first book that I ever read on my own by Ruth Krauss oh. I think it is I don't yeah. know that. I can see you know, a boy planted a carrot seed and everybody said it wouldn't come up. And I, anyway, everything from that <laughs> all the way to, um, God, I don't know, Eckhart Tolle books and everything. You had uh, the fiction, Once and Future King. You you um, had the Once oh, yeah. and Future King. And I love that. You could tell. I, I mean, I don't usually mark up books. And the Once and Future King. He says, the best thing for being sad, replied Merlin, beginning to puff and blow, is to learn something. That is the only thing that never fails. I love that. Um, yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah. That's a great line. Yeah. Like um, and, and there's a, yeah, they have a, there's a motto in the book. You're never alone when you're reading a book. Yeah. Right. And I always, it, it, you know, I turn to books when I'm sad and when I'm happy mm -hmm. and when I'm lonely and, and they're always there for me. And um, when I was little, I used to picture, and I and I kind of shaded this in in the story, I used to picture that the books were alive even when they were like facing out on the shelf yeah. and the pages mm. were closed and everything. I would sort of picture, what are they doing in there? And, and I thought this uh, that's, 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 that's great imagination. That's a great <laughs> book. 
<laughs> I love that. <laughs> well, um, let's talk a little bit about this central question in the Lost and Found bookshop, which is if you had to do it over again, what would you do and who would you be? So can you tell us a little bit about what inspired that central question? And then also, if you had Answered. to do it over again, <laughs> what would you do and who would you be? Yeah. Um, He's like, uh -oh. I <laughs> love the I love the, the drama of somebody having to having to face um, this this question in the middle of your life. And I don't I can't specifically remember personally ever coming to that moment like, oh my God, I'm on the wrong path. But um, if you were given that, it's, it's not really an opportunity. It's like an obligation yeah. for, for Natalie. Um, but she does mm -hmm. get to remake her life. And one of the things, um, it's funny that I start out talking about clothes and Mary, Mary Kay's outfit. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I was very conscious as I wrote Natalie's journey, um, who she was in the beginning versus who she was in the end. Because in the beginning, she's very buttoned down. She's corporate. There's a very terrible wine mishap on her white silk blouse and um, you know her fellow co-workers aren't very nice about it and and um, she kind of evolved her as her character evolves so does her wardrobe you know she finds herself trying on her mother's clothes because she's trying on new identities and then in the end when she's really kind of found the essence of herself um, the way that she feels in her body and feels in her clothes and everything it was it was a real key so mm. I'm not sure if you know, readers all would clue in on that, but I, I was very conscious of it and I'm not sure why. I'm, yeah, I'm not a it. huge clothes exactly. person, but I think that they do say something about the way you feel about yourself. Yeah. Mm. I, love the scene where she, I love the scene where she's going to the gala mm -hmm. at the museum and uh, the bookstore, the bookstore clerks were great characters, by the way, Cleo and what was the mm -hmm. guy's name? Oh, uh, Birdie, Cl Birdie, and, Birdie and Cleo. Birdie. I know yeah. I do that too. Birdie and Cleo. Yeah. Um, and Cleo, you know, makes her wear this gorgeous Chinese um, silk. I don't know the name of the dress, but it's long and it has the embroidery and it's turquoise and it's flashy. All the things that Natalie isn't. And I thought, wow, this is like a butterfly, you know, coming out of the chrysalis to me. Hmm. Okay, but Susan, yeah, if you had to do um, it over again, oh, sorry. <laughs> if I had to do it over personally, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah put, put her on the hot spot. seat, Christy. Oh God, yeah, just see, baby. Yeah, I I, pro I probably would have divorced my first husband sooner. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have to be that sooner. <laughs> that is hysterical. <laughs> but you know what? Um, being able to to Right is such a blessing. I can't yeah. imagine that I would do anything differently. Mm -hmm. um, I don't even, I wouldn't switch genres. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't unmake the mistakes that I made because everything takes you to where you're going. Yeah. If, yeah. You know, if I could get very yeah. philosophical on yeah, it. No. Everything yeah, absolutely. sort of leads into, you know, everything you encounter on your journey um, is put there for you to work through. And so I, you know, would I like a smoother path through my life? Wouldn't we all, but I don't know that I would reinvent um, a lot of, the, or make different choices. I know. Sure and I that think I would that even be able to do that. I completely agree because I think you, it's a joy of re reaching a certain age and it's both in your personal life, but also in your career when you can say, um, I see how all the decisions I made were a series of connecting the dots to bring me to where I am. When you're in it and living it and you're young, you don't necessarily see it. But okay, at this ladies. point, we can look back a yeah. little bit. All right, ladies. Uh, you know, I'm going to break with the script again and ask you one sentence, everybody, what would, if you, I love that question that Susan asked, if you had to do it over again, what would you do and who would you be? Christy? Hmm. Um, gosh, don't start with me. Um, I don't know. I mean, I actually was sitting here thinking that I think I'm really lucky because I sort of had one of those moments where 
someone in my life, I was working in a very different field and someone said to me, if you could do anything, what would you do? And I said, I really want to write a book. And, um, you know, I think I'm so invested in where I am now and I feel like it's really where I'm supposed to be. And that doesn't mean that, you know, right here is going to be the exact thing that I'm doing for the rest of my life. But I really kind of feel like I'm at the right place in my life. And, um, and I agree with Mary Alice that you can look back and see all those little dots. And there's some things that I can think about right now that felt like the world was ending. And if they had not happened, my life would be vastly different and much, much worse, right. I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Patty, Mary what about you? Alice? Oh, sorry. Oh, well, I, I think I answered, I definitely would be a writer. But if I right. was not allowed, that was the rule. You can't be the same thing. I'd be an opera singer. Ooh. Okay, Peach. <laughs> so let me get out my tool belt. I would have been a handyman with a hammer. No, <laughs> yeah, no. Hammer guy. Hammer guy. <laughs> I think, um, I, you know, I, I was a lot of things before I was a writer. So I, I, I feel like, I, like Christy, I had a moment where I asked my five-year-old daughter, what do you want to be when you grow up? And she said, a writer of books. And I said, no, that's what I want to be. And like the character in the book, Susan, I was about to hit, I was uh, approaching my 30s. And I was like, what am I waiting for? And so I think I did ask that question and I did shift. And um, that doesn't mean like Christy said that other shifts won't happen, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm right where I wanna be right now, right here. Yeah. And I mean, Kristen. we, we've talked about it many times on the show. So like, we know I'm writing a song with James Taylor, like that's coming <laughs> for me. Shortly. That's coming. Right. I mean, but I'll <laughs> still write books. I don't imagine that taking that long, but. but what if you, okay. But here's the thing. What if you can't come back as a writer? What would you do? Oh, wow. Well, you well, can't change the rules like that, Mary Alice. No, no, no. <laughs> no, you can't change the rules, Miss. We all love being a writer. We have a whole writer. show to get through. Maybe the after show we talk about oh, that. Okay, okay, Kristen, what Kristen. about you? Um, you know what? I, I would be a person who worried less about the future. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 42 now. And that is a lesson oh, that I don't, I don't think gasp. I've entire, how ghastly I know, but no, I, 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 um, I, I don't think it's a lesson I've fully learned yet, but I remember even just a decade ago, you know, I, I didn't get married till I was, um, almost 35. I didn't have Noah till I was almost 37. Um, and I spent a lot of those early years thinking that those things I wanted out of life were never going to happen for me. I, I worked a lot of years as a writer before I really had, you know, much success at all. And, and I think, um, I think as Mary Alice said, you can look back and kind of connect the dots now, but I, I wish I had worried less about it, um, in the past. And that's a commitment I will make going forward to, to try to just trust the journey and, and trust that even if it doesn't turn out exactly right, it, you'll, you'll get where you, where you need to go in the you, end. Exactly. You know? yep. Wise. Mm, yeah. Uh, you know, um, I, you know, I was, I thought I wanted to be a newspaper reporter and I was for a long time and then newspapers changed and I felt like I had the rug pulled out from under me. And I think it's a gift. I mean, it's a mm -hmm. gift in, in, in Susan's book, the lost and found bookshop when, um, Natalie has everything stripped away from her. Yep. It's all a burning, literally a burning plane wreck. And that only then does she um, eventually discover that she's where she, that the next place is where she wants to be. She yeah. literally is shoved off a cliff. And I think, yeah. um, I think for me, metaphorically, when newspapers changed and I hated it and, yeah. and then I was like, thank God I was left with no other choice. I yeah. knew I had to write. And I, and I, so I had to tunnel out, but anyway, gosh, we got so many great we do. audience we questions. Do. Let's, we let's do. go right let's, to that. You guys. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Who's asking well, the let's, first? Wait, let me, can I ask one more really quick before we get to that? Just no. Well, <laughs> I, I'm, um, you know, but you, Susan, you thanked a lot of the book, a lot of booksellers and your acknowledgements. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what Liberty Bay Books, our bookstore tonight, means to you? Sorry about that. Can you ask that again? I just oh. my my internet just sort of 
Oh, yes. I was just saying, can you tell us why you chose Liberty, Liberty Bay Books tonight and what that store means to you? Thank you for asking. I would love to tell you because um, I love the owner of Liberty Bay Books. Um, her name is Suzanne Selfers, and she is a um, children's author whom I've known as a writer for years, um, many years. And and she um, took she bought a bookstore in a little, very adorable little seafaring town called Paulsbo, Washington, um, and she opened she had her grand opening in wait for it february 2020 yeah <laughs> <laughs> and so not only did she have the challenge of founding her new enterprise her new bookshop but she also um got shut down probably about a month later and so i know that first year was amazing um for suzanne and her staff to kind of get through and so i have a lot of love for suzanne and for her bookshop she made it over it's a charming place and and um with the nicest staff you could imagine and so i i it was a no-brainer for me to say oh that's the one for friends in fiction that's awesome that's awesome well, i'm excited okay, now to hear we're the live questions yeah, yeah. we're going to pull some live questions who is pulling christy me i am me me me, me. <laughs> Um, we have so many questions for you, Susan. It's absolutely unbelievable. Um, I like this one a lot. So Alexis wants to know, do you know the title of your book before you write it or do you wait until it's almost finished? Well, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. Could you hear me? Um, I know the title that I want the book to have. Uh, <laughs> you know, oh, I, good I answer. Often, <laughs> I, I very often have, yeah. Um, and publishers have a sneaky way of having meetings about your titles and, and, oh, we've already got a similar title or we don't like the sound of that or it's not going to lend itself to a good cover. And so um, I, yeah. I always have a title in mind, but, it, well, I almost always. There, there, was, there have been a book or two where I couldn't come up with anything. But with the Lost and Found Bookshop, it, um, it just felt like such a good fit. Um, thematically with the book. So, uh, and luckily it was, um, it appealed to my publisher as well. So that one, I did know. The Oysterville Sewing Circle, I did know. Other ones, um, there's much discussion and um, very often the title that I want never makes it into the book. Um, in, in the Lost and Found Bookshop, Natalie is reading um, a book that her mother had left on the bedside table. Booksellers get a lot of um, advanced reading copies of books and um, so that they can, you know, preview yeah. what's cut, what's coming. And she's reading a book called Acts of Light. And that was actually my title for a book that was published as Map of the Heart. And oh, so I, I love that. I recycled that cool title that I really liked. Yeah. I did oh, too. Cool. I thought it was a great title, but it didn't, Beautiful. it didn't resonate with people at my publisher. And so I had to change it to Map of the Heart, which is okay, but I didn't love it. Like it, you know, oh, I thought that I was a really yeah. cool title. I do. And yeah, so, yet another Easter egg. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, the other Easter egg is the author signing with the lady named Quill Ransom. She was oh, a yeah. very, you know, um, her, her books were were beloved by readers, and she has that disastrous book signing. Oh my and god! It was like every I was having an anxiety attack for the, when I was in, reading that. In real life, I kind of visited them on. <laughs> did you have this, like PTSD or something? You're like, oh, yeah, I did. Yeah. And nobody comes, and you you got all dressed up, and you bought the, the you put the candy dish out, and your sign up sheet, and your uh -huh. ready to go, and nobody comes. They just pull the cookies. <laughs> we all. I, I tell I tell booksellers I tell booksellers pe people stay away in droves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Patty, you've got a question. Some right? authors have that X factor. They 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 kind of, you know, they draw readers to them like the pilgrims to Lourdes. But I am not that writer. I'm my my readers are all home reading books and wondering where my next book is. So um, like, like yeah, book, book signings can be very um very humbling. Yes, yes. for all of us, Susan, for all of us. Yeah. So 
Speaking of map of the heart, this is so synchronistic. One of the live questions we have is from a woman named Carrie Soderman. And she said, I love map of the heart. So did, did I. You, <laughs> did you enjoy writing historical fiction and will you write another one? Uh oh. Could you hear the question? I'm looking for Carrie Soderman's question because I no no I'm telling you it's, she I asked didn't. she I'm said I'm so sorry she yeah, didn't hear I the question a, I'll just repeat it again, yeah Susan. I will um, <clears> she <throat> said I loved Map of the Heart did you ever did you enjoy writing historical fiction and will you write another one are you having trouble uh, hearing yes us? and yes and okay um, that's uh, no I can I can hear it now yeah so. Um, Map of the Heart was probably the most enjoyable research and writing trip I ever made because we, uh, Jerry and I had a rental car and we drove through France for like five weeks and it was amazing. And um, I loved every minute of it. And I tried to, you know, pour all that into the book. So yes, absolutely. I would love to do another one. And in fact, I'm kind of noodling with an idea where I, um, earlier in my career, I wrote a lot of historical romance novels. And so, right. uh, and, and I'm re I'm listening to the audio books of those that were just re recorded in audio um, because I'm thinking of doing a contemporary um, that is that connects to those historical romances. So I'm oh, what a great idea with that. But I do I love love yeah. That, awesome. Well, we'll see. <laughs> All <laughs> ideas are great till I start writing them down and then they suck. Yeah, <laughs> know. we know. know oh yes, know. but that's the journey. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'll tell you. Every week, Susan, yeah. one of our very favorite parts of the show is to receive a writing tip from our guests, and so we would love to hear a writing tip from an author who is a three times winning Rita Award winning author who has written rom-coms, romances, historicals, and contemporary fiction. So what writing tip do you have to share with us? Um, I think just if I have to narrow it down to one, it would be let your natural voice come through. Hmm. And what I mean by that is don't try to write like you think you're supposed to sound on the page. Don't try to write like, um, you know, don't, don't fuss about, is it correct? Is it grammatical or anything like that? Put your heart on paper, whatever that looks like. And, you know, mm -hmm. worry about the mechanics later. But I think people get so hamstrung and they get, yeah. you know, almost like stage fright. I don't, I can't write this. I don't have enough education or I don't know where I'm going or I don't know what to, you know, those kind of things. But if you let your natural voice come through and write about things that are, you know, come from deep inside you, that's where to start. That, that could, you know, okay. hopefully get you going for at least 17 pages. And then you'll think, well, what was I thinking? This, <laughs> I'm good. Uh, yeah, she yeah, that's being a financial probably plan. That's where I, <laughs> I should do well, inventory no, I, control. I, I was thinking inventory about the question. Control. And um, yeah, exactly. No, no, I was thinking about the question because one of the one of one workshop that I've done a couple of different times is how to write a love letter. And it's for oh, anybody, not oh, just write. It's not a writing workshop. Oh my and goodness. It's, a, it's one yeah, yeah, it's okay. one hour. I love that. And everybody uh, you know, anybody can come in and, and I was giving it in, um, in Cannon Beach, Oregon, beautiful little town at this um, um, lovely seaside um, conference room or something like that. And anybody could come and it was free. And um, I kind of walked them through the steps and, and, you know, asked the questions and things like that. And there was this giant like lumberjack looking guy way in the back of the room and he had his car hearts on and his plaid shirt and everything. And he just broke down and started crying. <laughs> and he said, this is so good. I didn't know I could write. And I was like, oh, my gosh. And it was because I kept telling them, don't worry about, you know, how it how it looks the on the page or how you think sound. it's supposed to sound. Just, yeah, put your heart on paper. So. Yeah, oh, nice. I That's wanted. I, I'd love to take that course. What a beautiful idea. How to write a love letter. That's a great it's title some, of a book. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, no yeah. kidding. Go okay. write it. You know, Come we on. are running really close to time. So, Susan, okay. one moment, stick <laughs> around. We're going to ask one more question of you well, because it's yeah. one of our favorites. We're not going to kick you out just yet, but Patty <laughs> wants to tell us about needs to tell us about the podcast. Well, first, we want to remind all of you out there to check out our podcast. We'll mm-hmm. always post links under announcements each time a new one comes out. It is so much fun, y'all. We are having so much fun with all these new interviews. And not only do we post the audio of our live web shows like this one, but we have all this original debut content every Friday morning. And as we told you last week, superstar librarian Ron Block, who we all know and love, is now the is now the captain Yay, Ron! of our podcast Yay. ship. Because forever and ever, we are going to talk about ship metaphors. His first (laughs) podcast with us under the Friends and Fiction Writer's Block banner debuts this week on June 11th with our Christy Woodson Harvey, Wade Rouse, and Alyssa Friedland. In case you're like a lot of us and you're having a little trouble finding your path, what? I said it was so fun. It was so it fun. It was so fun. I already <laughs> listened to it. It was really, really good. Y'all can't, y'all are going to want to click on it right when it downloads on Friday. But in case you're like a lot of us and you're unsure to ha- how to find the Friends in Fiction podcast, here is a short video made by our superstar managing director that she <laughs> says cringe alert. But here we go. <laughs> on your iPhone. Tap the purple podcast icon. Tap search and enter friends and fiction in the search bar. Choose friends and fiction. Tap the purple subscribe button. Scroll through the available episodes and tap one to listen. Enjoy. Welcome to. Meg, that's our Meg. Yeah, fabulous. Yes. Awesome. And right. don't forget, if you have not yet, to join the Friends and Fiction official book club hosted by our friends Lisa Harrison and Brenda Gardner. It is yet another way to stay connected to this great community. Right now, our book club is reading Mary Kay's brand new bestseller, The Newcomer, which they'll be discussing on June 21st with Mary Kay. And next up is Mary Alice's The Summer of Lost and Found. So this is your chance to hang out with the authors and ask them all your questions um, while also, you know, getting to hang out more with your friends and fiction friends. And really, you guys, what is a book club without (laughs) snacks? I ask you. It's the eternal question. So, of course, you will want to bring along Mama G's while you talk about the newcomer. As always, you can get 20% off orders on their website, mamageraldines.com, with the code FAB5. And speaking of snacks and the things that go with them, don't forget your Story Point wine and our fun summer of Story Point. Stick around after the credits roll for our Sip and Stay Story Point after show where we might, yeah, no, we definitely have a pop in (laughs) surprise for you. (laughs) Stick around. And next week, join us right here at 7 p.m. for a very special night as we launch Mary Alice's first middle grade book written with Angela May. Mary Alice's special guest will be famed naturalist and award-winning best-selling author, Cy Montgomery, the author of The Soul of an Octopus and The Good, Good Pig. And if you're ever wondering about our schedule, it's always on the Friends in Fiction website, as well as the sidebar of events on our Friends in Fiction Facebook page. All right, now back to Susan for one last question, which is one of our favorites. Susan, you talked a little bit about your experience with Shakespeare and Company, but can you tell us a little bit about the values around reading and writing in your childhood and your childhood home and how they shaped you as the writer you grew into? I think she's having computer difficulty. Hey, Susan. Yeah, I am. Yeah, okay. I think we're back. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I, I want to. Um, uh, if people Ooh. will put their questions that they still have on your on your Facebook page, I'm, I'd be happy to go and um, oh, answer right. them there. Oh, thank, thank you. you that's so sweet. No problem. Yeah. Perfect, I'm one Susan. of your 40,000. You're oh. legions of 40,000. <laughs> awesome. Well, fantastic. Susan, could you just tell us quickly what the influences around reading and writing in your childhood were, aside from Shakespeare and Company? 
my mom and my dad both. Um, we, we were a reading family. My mom actually had a book club before there were even book clubs. They didn't, they didn't call them oh, book cool. clubs, you know, back in the 60s yeah. and 70s. They, you know, but they would they would all show up with books and swap books. And we did live overseas, we mentioned earlier. And so um, she would get together with the other American wives and, um, and swap English language books and everything. And we just always were a whole reading family. It was part of our culture i guess and you know it was always surprising to me that um that other families didn't have that you know not all other families but and then i also had that teacher that i wish every kid would have in the third grade um oh, i don't know if they still her. do this but it used to be in the third grade you would graduate from from like manuscript printing to cursive writing and that was like a big deal for me and I had a third grade teacher named Mrs. Green Marge Green and she <laughs> um, had that perfect Palmer method writing and <laughs> and I told and, and I was always a precocious reader probably we all were I was always reading ahead and so she said and I told her I said I'm going to be a book writer and she said well if you're going to be a book writer you should write a book and she sat me down and she gave me all the tools and by God, I wrote a book in her third grade class and I still have oh, it. Awesome. <laughs> oh, you have it. Now that's I do. It's called a book about some bad kids. Wow. I wrote that's it and illustrated it, stapled it together. Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, yeah the stapler. With, with the line. So those those were probably my earliest that influences line. that I can think of. It's so I great to have story. yours. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. I love that story. So everybody out there, since we're talking about My workshops and stories, we want to encourage you to grab Susan's book, The Lost and Found Bookshop, which came out in paperback yesterday. There it is. Don't forget to visit the Liberty Bay Bookshop page to order Susan's book and all the Fab Five books, including pre-ordering Kristen's upcoming The Forest of Vanishing Stars and Mary Alice's The Alice, The Isl <laughs> Islander. <laughs> Susan, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you for thank being you. with Thanks, us. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. You're awesome. Oh, you guys, thank, thank you. you. This was such a pleasure. I, I, I yeah, love this hour. Us. This was my favorite hour of the day. So thank you so oh, much. Thank and you. good luck with the podcast. I, I just subscribed on my phone. So hey, I saw hey, you. Hey, were hey, on that. You were thank you, Meg. Thank well, we'll you, talk Meg. to you on the podcast. Okay, you take care. Oh. Yes. Y'all don't leave yet. Okay. We've got a lot of Y'all take care. And thank you again. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye for now. Bye. We say goodbye to Susan, but y'all don't leave yet. We've got lots to, a lot to say doing our sip and stay with Story Point after show. And come back next week, same time, same place, because it's the launch of my middle grade novel, The Islanders. And I've invited my co-author, Angela May and Cy Montgomery. But now for the, get your wine ready, Story Point wine, the sip and Thank you for tuning in. Join us every week on Facebook or YouTube, where our live show airs every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And please, subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Instagram. We're so glad you're here. Good night. Oh, hey, everybody. Thanks for hanging with us. Oh, my God. This is an important part of the after show. Where did she go? Oh, exactly. Oh. She's a band to dust. Exactly. <laughs> I'm going to get for a second. There we go. Yes, There's our, there we yeah, are. Isn't that fun? Oh, There's our banner. Right. So everybody, pretty. welcome to our story. It's hard to say that many S's in a row. It is. It is. And stay with Sip story and stay point. Stay with story point after show. Ah. And as we mentioned earlier, we're happy, happy, happy to be partnering with story point wines as the official sponsor of our after show. All summer long, it will be the summer of Story Point here on Friends in Fiction. And I would also like to remind you, as Meg said, you came up with the name, Mary Kay. <laughs> you know, I love an alliteration. I know, it's my fault that it's sip you just say with Story Point. <laughs> you have to say it. That's the rule. Maybe no smiles. Sip and stay with 
Yes. Exactly. So Story Point, as you know, comes in three varietals, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Cabernet. I like all three, but what I really like is what they stand for, a love of stories and storytelling. Mm. Oh, yeah. As they say at Story Point, many great stories and ideas unfold over a shared bottle of wine. So who knows better than that than all of you and us here at Friends in Fiction. So every yes. Wednesday night, throughout June, July, and August, we hope you'll stick around for the Friends and Fiction after show to sip and stay with Story Point. Wait a second. Uh, since we're, uh, we're oh. since, wait, 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 oh, no, no, wait no, 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 not yet. No. Wait. Oh, okay. Let me cue you first. Okay. <laughs> Why are you putting me in charge? I know. Surprise! She literally said she did not want to be in charge of the sound effects. She said Ah. she did say she did say that. Okay, so because we're about alliteration here, we want to talk about sip and stay story point surprises. (laughs) Okay, now. Okay. Someone's Wait, at the what, door. What's that? It's someone at the door. Look, who is it? Who is it? Who is it? Who okay, is I don't want to. I see your head. Say hi, Paula. Hey, hi, Paula. Hi, Paula. Hi, Paula. Hi, Paula. How are you? This is fun. Yeah, we're, we're so excited here. to see you. But <laughs> so. Paula, meet all the ladies. I think you know everyone. Who you know, know Mary Alice. Hello. Hi, Paula. With Kristen. Mary oh, Alice, yeah. I remember dancing in a nightgown in crazy Texas. I had the best costume, right, that night. <laughs> and Christy was a princess. Yeah. She yeah. still is. She still is. She still and is, then, yeah. And have you ever I'm met Mary Kay? I've never met Mary Kay. I'm a this fan, is a pleasure. though. Absolutely. The pleasure is the pleasure is all mine. And yeah. so um, I I hesitate to say that we could have a story point surprise <laughs> sit and stay <laughs> clobber party. Yes, <laughs> party. Oh, oh, Lord. So oh, Lord. before we move on, I want to tell everyone out there that Paula is going to be with us on the show on Can't wait. July 17th. 14th? Meg will correct Get it straight. Okay. Get it straight. I think it's July 14th. July 14th. I could be making that up. And yes. we are going to be talking about her fabulous, amazing New York Times bestseller, When the Stars Go Dark. I and can't wait Rachel. to ask her how she decided to write, go totally, totally. Yep. Um, Cross over to the no. dark. <laughs> yeah, that thing. That yeah. thing went wrong. That thing. And we are in California right now, and um, which is where the book takes place and where yeah. you did your research. Yeah, not far. And I'm a California native, so it's really great to be back vibing with all the good energy. Yeah. And we're here cooking and hiking and writing. And writing and brainstorming. And resetting and, and restoring. And yeah, there might Sounds be a blowout. Wonderful. There might be. <laughs> wasn't tonight. We came to I got a blow out today. I got I got a beach hair, so that works, right? But your hair's <laughs> always your hair perfect, always see? looks like you're ready you're for a magazine shoot. Opposite. Yeah. The opposite of a blur. I just had an idea that you guys should do something called Oh Hi from Oh Hi. Oh, hi from Ojai. Oh, hey, from Ojai. But Paula, yeah. you, I'm yeah, sorry, this is, this is like back to a minute ago, but you really have, I mean, you've written a lot of genres because you started out in memoir, right? I started out actually in poetry. poetry. And poetry. Oh, oh poetry. I didn't know that. Okay. I have a memoir about growing up in foster care. Um, and then I have a first novel which is contemporary. And then that's when I had the idea for the Paris wife. So then three historicals, and then I blew the roof off. <laughs> it's a thriller. I don't want to waste our July 14th show. So yeah, we have to no. say no. something. It's, it's right. It's yeah. not the first time I've gone. Mm. Maybe I, maybe, <laughs> went rogue. maybe that's my theme. Maybe that's your thing. Maybe I'm like Madonna and I just reinvent myself every go. decade. I like it. I think you just like really have to do that to, you know, you just go rogue. Yeah. Well, I think we do have, we to, have to 
we have to um, say yes to opportunities that invite us, mm -hmm. to, you know, to change yeah. and to grow. And when inspiration right. comes that is terrifying, we still have yeah. to say yes because it's a threshold. And if we have yeah. the grit and the courage to cross the threshold, yeah. then we'll be taken to a new place. And creatively, yeah. and as women, yeah. we have to continue to grow or else what are we doing here? A hundred percent. Yeah. I, you know, when I read your New York times piece, um, uh, Paula wrote an amazing essay. Was it modern love? modern love? It was modern love. Yeah. Right. Thank you. And, uh, it was so brave and so, um, yeah. uh, poignant and, and all the things. And then I can see how as a writer, I can kind of see how you, you were there and then you went. Yeah, there is a, and that piece, you know, I think one of the reasons why I wrote it is because I needed to, for myself to connect the dots. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do think Joan Didion has a line, something like, it's good to stay on nodding terms with our former selves. Oh, I like we could think that our former selves, again, if we look back with, open eyes and um, are willing to really look closely, I think we can learn a lot from the past yeah. and pull yeah. it forward. And we so I to. wanted to go back through and see the ways my childhood trauma yeah. um, was affecting my current everything and really every relationship, every romantic relationship I've ever had. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and obviously it feeds into my work too, the trauma and this book, When the Stars Go Dark, is all about, you know, how, how trauma shapes us and then how we can free ourselves from, yeah. right, the patterns of the past, the shackles of early experiences to, um, to rescue ourselves, right? How, that, yeah. where, come in how is it possible and how can we resolve the wounds of the past it's about that yeah i wish we had been able to get into that with susan because she alluded mm -hmm. to it a little bit yeah um when she this was talking about susan wiggs oh i wish i had been yeah. here with susan go to the grocery store somebody has to cook and get <laughs> kombucha for my friend <laughs> Well, I, I did think Susan really touched on that beautifully about how we can look back and, and you know, how she had to make choices and she made different choices right. and how it all led to the author she is today. And God knows she's written so many different books. She wrote um, romance. She wrote historical romances right. and, mm -hmm. and she wrote um, women's fiction. And mm -hmm. God only knows that like, no one's going to hold her back. But it's yeah. again that deciding to keep keep the flow going and writing what you I, feel you want. Yeah, to write. I loved how she kind of um mined her own experience. Yes. And mm -hmm. she didn't talk a lot about that, but I would love to have heard about it. Mm -hmm. Talking about you know, some kind of loss in her life. And mm -hmm. um I know her mom is still living. She talks about her mom and her social media. So um you know, maybe we should lighten it up a little. What do you think, right? girls? <laughs> yeah. Can we go back to celebrating that Kristen is number nine on the New York Times? Yes, yes. that's a good <laughs> thing to celebrate. Lift your story <laughs> point, ladies. Lift, Lift your story, up your story point. point line for yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank okay, you. so Cheers. if you were going to ever own a bookstore, your own bookstore, oh. what, if you've ever fantasized about that, mm -hmm. what, <laughs> would, what would be what would your bookstore be and what would, what would it be called even? Do you know? Oh gosh. <laughs> no. Christy knows. Okay, Christy, Christy knows. knows. Christy, has Christy knows. <laughs> What's your bookstore called, Christy? Mm -hmm. So my bookstore would actually be Jesus. on a boat that stays <laughs> docked all the time, which is kind uh -huh. of, you read my book feels uh -huh. like falling. You kind of get the idea of this. Mm -hmm. um, anybody out there? And it would be called, sequel but it would be spelled like s-e-a-q-u-e-l-l -E love it oh my god love genius it. So when are you going to open this store you've it's obviously tuned. given it as soon as i can there. talk will into letting me he's like because you don't have enough to do that's a no, really good say, idea yeah, let's see right. if you can this work go completely crazy yeah great yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
If only you didn't have to raise a child and write books. Yeah, I think there should be a way to include Airstream trailers in a book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that yes. idea. Like they were that. sort of gutted and there would be like reading nooks mm -hmm. in the little curved spaces. I like I that. Know, like, like a book, yeah, like, a cool, like a cool bookmobile, what with cocktails? Is that what you're exactly. saying? I love it. Like when you, when you do the wine tastings in California, only it's mm -hmm. maybe wine and a book. How's but that? it would be I like, like um, what's the place in Florida? It's Seaside that has all the airstreams. Oh, oh, is there one? oh, I don't know. There's yeah, one in Palm oh. Springs too that there are like hotels that, or rooms for a hotel and they're in a circle around the pool, which is not oh, a terrible yes. idea because who doesn't like to read by the pool? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Great and idea. It can be done by genre, right? It could be current fiction, backlist fiction. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. I was going to say, you and Christy so are actually real. on a roll mm -hmm. here. There we go. So, what are we going to? What are you going to call it, Paula? So, what are we going to call it? Sequel. Like, sequel. I think the name's sequel. sequel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't you know. know. Right right right. Is, um, I'll do we'll mine on a sailboat. Title. I'll do mine on a sailboat and call it Best Sailor, and you can call <laughs> your sequel. I love my there you go. Oh my mm. gosh, this is so creative. Is so I we went to a bookstore today that is an outdoor it's book entirely store. outdoors. Entirely, entirely outdoors. Books. 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 And it was the wow. bomb. I mean what if we, it rains? I was just gonna yeah, say I'm just my whole mind is yes. I said, happen. what do you guys have awnings you put down? Or he said, No, we have like covers on most of the books, and it doesn't rain sideways here. I was like, oh, okay, yeah, but it still goes down. It's a very dry climate. They it's don't a very dry really climate. Get a lot of rain. So the yeah. used books are on the kind of outdoorsy part, and the brand new books are a little bit more protected. They had That's like that really wow. Yeah, it was That's an outdoor. Cool. I don't know. That's beautiful, and then and then on the end caps, it was all succulents. Yeah. Oh my gosh! Oh, that's that's cool. Cool. I took pictures and video, so I'll post Gorgeous. on my social media really if you guys beautiful. want to see them. Yeah. Really beautiful. Thank you. That yeah. would really can't help. Decide if with yeah. best sailor getting I can't, inspired. I can't decide yeah, I know. if Christy's I'm just looking at your face should, there over there, Christy. If it should be a bookstore called Sequel or a protein drink called mm. Sequel. <laughs> S-E-Q-U-L. Oh, because, millenni because millennials don't really, <laughs> they don't care. S-E-Q-U-L. Mm -hmm. I, like that. Yeah, I mean, I, someone told me recently that I am actually an elder millennial, which was nice. Like, it's nice to be called an elder anything, <laughs> especially an elder in a talk that you're giving, which is nice. So, um, but you know, yeah, I mean, I like that. I pro it could, it could be both. Like I could sell the protein shakes or it could be a new kombucha. I'm also a big kombucha fan. So Patty, if you have any suggestions, I'm on it. I'll think of, it'll probably preoccupy me for the rest of the night. Oh, Kristen, what are you going to call your bookstore? I have absolutely no idea. I can't beat any of that. So I just, I'm, I'm out. I, I, yeah, I admit defeat. I, I'm going to visit Ms. your June. bookstores, girls. I'll come visit. <laughs> Ms. So it could be Miss, Miss June books. Yeah. That is true. I, I could, yeah. I, I really haven't done enough with my status as a centerfold. So you're right. You haven't. Yeah. Wow. Thanks, June. Thank you. It's a whole I new was world. thinking the forest of book stars. <laughs> I think exactly. it's be called Miss June. Miss not June. as good as sales. Um, best sailor. Best sailor. Yeah. Best sailor. <laughs> yeah, seller is great. Yeah. I was going to call mine just beach books and it would only sell um, books that you would want to read at mm. the beach. Like and that. maybe, yeah, maybe I'll just like, you know, since we're fantasizing, I'll just like move it from beach town to beach town. Mm -hmm. oh, I like in, the, in the little um, mm -hmm. it can be like start a in the mobile. south. Yeah, I start in the in the deep south when summer comes. You know, basically in February, <laughs> Florida. <laughs> you know, I Florida just keep rolling. <laughs> True. Yeah, yeah. But True. I like, I like the sailor. I'm really pissed off, Christy, <laughs> that you. Stole that well, idea. There will be some opportunities to franchise if you would like to. We can talk about it after the show. <laughs> this, this is why we. That's why you're our CFO. You're always thinking. Yeah. 
<laughs> I do like though when I run across somebody who's on the beach reading something that's not beachy, you know, yeah. like a big biography of Lincoln or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, yeah. Like, yeah. average yeah. spirit. Mm -hmm. So Any you should books. have some yeah. outliers in mm -hmm. your beach. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. definitely. Mobile mm -hmm. or whatever. Yeah, just, maybe I you agree. could have like a shelf of uh irreverent options. There you mm -hmm. go. Oh, I like, Ooh, I like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. A hive mind here. We've thought about the most perfect bookstores ever. Mm -hmm. How well we have to do is start opening them, right? <laughs> no, oh, we got to spare time. time. We got to keep writing them. Okay. I know our evening needs to draw to the Oh my God, y'all. No one, de please do not DM <laughs> me about Oh my God. <laughs> 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 Don't, please. <laughs> it's not <laughs> happening, guys. It's not <laughs> happening. That's hilarious. <laughs> Christy, um, do you want to talk about how we're trying to boost story points? Um, yes, I do. So um, we are really close, you guys, to a thousand Instagram followers for story point. So mm. y'all go follow them on Instagram. Here, look. I'll, um, while Can you demonstrate? Patty's talking, I'll pull it up, okay? So you know what would be fun? If you could also snap some selfies with a glass or bottle of story points, and then you can tag them and tag friends in fiction, and we will put it in our stories. We will. And so if you want we to will. follow them, they're at story the point thing. lines. Can you see it? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Story yeah. point yeah. lines on Instagram. Yep. There are 955 followers. Ooh, really, really close. We're almost so. there. Yes. And that means a lot. You y'all know how grateful we are that you support mm -hmm. us. So we're almost at a thousand. We can do this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. And so, you know, that's it for us tonight, you guys. See you next week. It's a big week for us because we're going to launch Mary Alice's middle grade book, Gotta The Islanders. Yay. There it is. Yeah. And Paula, how nice to see you. What, what a nice, nice surprise. surprise. Well, thank you. I thought that was a super fun little interlude. Yeah. And yeah. what are you really cooking? Great. What are you are you cooking kombucha for dinner? Do you fry that? Or? <laughs> <laughs> Paula is an amazing, amazing cook. Amazing. Oh, Do you lucky. like fillet it first? I'm making we're making street tacos tonight yep. with mango Ooh. and cilantro and Pickled red onions and, and, uh, and roasted peppers and mm. chicken and, chicken. and rice. Oh, my gosh. Ooh. What time what are, are you cheese? serving? Feta melted cheese. Oh, feta cream. And, oh, and, filet, of co and filet of kombucha. <laughs> and filet of kombucha. <laughs> because Kathy's up on the kombucha thing. She's yeah. really <laughs> totally. <laughs> yeah. Y'all, we're, so so we're already at 981. Yeah, yeah. In, in, in real time, we're at 981 on Story Point, you guys. Good. Let's, let's, let's do this. Oh, so Good night, Bye. everybody. Bye, Paula. Bye, Paula. Good night.